Good evening and welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones. Joining us tonight, the Prime Minister, Julia Gillard. Please welcome her. <laughs> Q&A is live from 9.35 Eastern Time. It's simulcast on ABC News 24, News Radio and Australia Network. And you can go to our website to send your questions in and you can join the Twitter conversation as well using the hashtag that's just appearing on your screen. Well, yesterday the Prime Minister announced her long-awaited policy for a carbon tax and eventually a carbon trading scheme. She's told Australia that her plan will initially cost families less than $10 a week, but by 2050 will reduce Australian emissions by 80%. Tony Abbott says it will drive up prices and threaten jobs but do nothing for the environment. That it's socialism dressed up as environmentalism. Tonight's Q&A is your chance to ask the questions. Let's get straight to our very first question tonight, which comes from Tim Elliott. Massive economic change like this has only ever been imposed with either bipartisan support, like floating the dollar, or with an election mandate, like the GST. To do otherwise is an affront to our democracy. Prime Minister, how do you justify imposing such a monumental reform that's this controversial without an election mandate. <laughs> Thanks for that question. The nation's been debating pricing carbon, putting a price on carbon pollution for the best part of a decade now. And both political leaders went to the 2007 election saying we should put a price on carbon pollution. Of course, in the 2010 election, I talked to the Australian people about having an emissions trading scheme. And we will get to an emissions trading scheme. We will have a temporary carbon tax and then a permanent emissions trading scheme. My view is the time has come to get this done. It's been a difficult debate, sometimes a bitter debate, but we need to act to cut carbon pollution and I'm determined to do that. Of course, people will have their vote in 2013. They'll be able to vote knowing what the carbon pollution tax means, uh, with big polluters paying the price, and also what it means for them and their family with tax cuts, family payment increases, and increases in the pension. To get to the specifics of his question, which of the big reforms, truly big ones like this, were done in the past without a specific election mandate? Well, I think some of the things that needed to be done to adjust our economy in the 1980s, uh, uh, you know, were decision making in government. Uh, yes, uh, Prime Minister Howard took the GST to an election. Absolutely, I acknowledge that. Uh, but on the road to this debate, we've been through a different process. I mean, both political parties going to the 2007 election saying we need to price carbon. Obviously, the Labor Party going to the 2010 election saying we needed to tackle climate change and we needed an emissions trading scheme. So we've got to get there. We've got to get this done. And I'm determined to do it you from the 1st of July you next year. You looked at one critical thing uh, there, but one of our questioners is picking that up. And uh, he's John Slater. Prime Minister, Wayne Swan and yourself were um, against Kevin Rudd's ETS and carbon tax. Indeed, this, was, this view was reinforced in your pre-election pledge, there'll be no carbon tax under the government I lead. Is it therefore true that if you'd won a majority in your own right, that we would not have this tax at all? We'd have a different uh, system in this sense. Let, let's go through the history here, and I'm happy to go through the history. Uh, in the last parliament, the carbon pollution reduction scheme ran into a brick wall. We couldn't get it through the parliament. Then, in the 2010 election, I spoke to the Australian people about having an emissions trading scheme, a scheme where you cap the amount of pollution that your economy is going to generate. After the 2010 election in this parliament, it became clear to me that I had a choice. Last time I was on this show, I talked about hitting a roadblock, a roadblock that I could have sat at and done nothing or making a choice to tackle climate change and price carbon pollution. So I made a choice. It was a difficult choice. I could have either said, you know, kept to what I said during the 2010 campaign, no carbon tax and never have got us to an emissions trading scheme or I could do what I did, which was make, I believe, the right decision for the nation's future and get us pricing carbon and to the emissions trading scheme. Now, I didn't foresee we were gonna get there 
via a three-year fixed price period, effectively a three-year tax, but we will get there. We will get this done, and it's in the nation's interest to do it, to cut carbon pollution. The time has come to move beyond what has been a difficult debate with a lot of hurdles along the way and to price carbon pollution, and that's where we'll get to 1st of July next year. Since you're uh, happy to go through the history, sure. Kevin Rudd was also happy to do that on this program earlier this year. He said there were people in the Cabinet who wanted to get rid of the ETS altogether. Uh, were you one of them? Look, Tony, I'm not going to talk about Cabinet discussions, but I am going to say this and say it uh, very clearly. The Carbon Pollution Reduction Scheme ran into a brick wall in the Parliament. It didn't become the law of this country. It wasn't ever going to be the law of this country. In the last Parliament, it wasn't going to get through. So we ran into but a this brick is what, wall. But this is what Mr Rudd said. You had some folk in the Cabinet who wanted to get rid of it altogether, that is, kill off the ETS as a future proposition for the country. That's a quote, Kevin Rudd. Well, I'm very happy to tell you what I've always believed. What I've always believed is we needed to price carbon, and the best way of doing it was to have an emissions trading scheme, and we will get there. And in terms of the journey to this place, to this moment, it's been tough. It's been an obstacle course. That's the truth of it, Tony. It hasn't been some Was Kevin easy... Rudd one of the speed bumps on the obstacle course? Uh, no, of course not. <laughs> of course not. Kevin, uh, Kevin, like me, is genuine about fighting climate change, genuine about putting a price on carbon. But let's be really clear here. I talk as Prime Minister about doing the tough things that need to be done to build this nation's future. I talk about how we've taken tough decisions in the past. I talk about the need to walk the reform road to get the tough things done today that will make us a better nation in the future. Okay, but, now, when but... I talk about those things, people might think this is a nice straight road and you just meander along it. It's actually not a nice straight road. It's full of obstacles. You've got to get over, get round. Sometimes okay. it's not pretty. Sometimes you smash your head on the way through. But we are going to get there and do this job that the nation needs I'm done gonna, from I'm the 1st of July I'm just going to press you year. on this issue. Um, don't the public have a right to know whether or not you originally wanted to kill off the ETS, to put, put it in Kevin Rudd's words, and then had a sort of road to Damascus conversion on this issue that's led you to this point? Oh, well, if, if that's your question, I'm not going to reveal confidential discussions in Cabinet. I don't think that's the right thing to do. But if you're asking you me... You revealed it in caucus. Well, if, you, if you're asking me about my beliefs, Tony, and I think that's what's the real nub of your question and what you're asking me about, I've always believed the best thing we could do to cut carbon pollution was to have an emissions trading scheme. That wasn't what I asked you, actually. Well, I, what, what I asked it's, you it's is whether a... you told <laughs> no, Kevin Rudd to kill off the ETS and <laughs> whether you were one of the people he named in Cabinet who went to him and asked to kill off the ETS. That was the question. The, the thing that killed off the carbon pollution reduction scheme is we couldn't get it through the Parliament. Now, in this Parliament, arguably in more difficult circumstances, we are going to get the package I announced yesterday through so that it becomes the law of this country and comes into effect on the 1st of July next year. Plans don't cut carbon pollution. Pricing carbon cuts carbon pollution. Getting it through the parliament matters and we will get this through the parliament. Let's go back to our uh, questioners. We've got a question from Lisa Cordiff. I've been, I've been following this issue with interest over the past couple of years and believe a price on pollution is an essential ingredient in driving investment in renewables in Australia. But when I talk to family and friends about the issue, I see their eyes glaze <laughs> over. I reckon there's a real lack of understanding out there and I'm wondering how you plan on communicating the importance of a price on pollution effectively because the communication has been a little bit embarrassing so far with all due respect. We want you to convince people that it's a good idea and the way it's talked about has to change. Do you recognise this? And if so, what's the plan? I recognise that there's a lot of confusion around and I've got a lot of explaining to do and I'm intending to do that and hopefully I'll get the opportunity to do some of that tonight. But it seems to me when you take it right back to its essential essence, pricing carbon is really very simple to understand, which is at the moment our big polluters can put carbon pollution in our atmosphere for absolutely nothing. 
So why wouldn't you do it endlessly? Why wouldn't you do it in vast quantities? It's not costing you anything. The thing that will drive a change in behaviour by big polluters is if we charge a price and then they'll say, well, if I'm going to have to pay a price to put another tonne of carbon pollution in the atmosphere, what can I do in my business with the work that I do to generate less carbon pollution and avoid that cost? And that's what drives the innovation. Really, it's no more complicated than thinking about uh, the way we deal with rubbish at home. Uh, I grew up in the days when you could take rubbish to the tip for nothing. You'd just be able to chuck stuff in landfill, any amount. You could fill up your trailer. People used to on the weekend take it to the tip and dump it there. Now, of course, we've got to pay when we take things to the tip. And that makes people think, will I throw that out or will I recycle it? It's changed our behaviour. So pricing carbon, asking big polluters to pay, is no more complicated than having asked us to pay when we go and take stuff to the tip. It means we do it less. Let's go back to our questioner. She obviously wants to get back in there. So uh, do, do you think, uh, what do you identify as being the, the big problem of this failure to communicate? The, the problem with the communications is that you're talking over people's heads, even using the word carbon. Um, a lot of the people that I speak to, my dear old mum here, might just sometimes say... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think she's agreeing she, with you. <laughs> she, she understands the issue, but it's the way it's talked. It's, 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 it's just not talked to people. And that's why Tony Abbott is making his mark. I mean, he's talking in words that people understand and they can relate to. And I think that that's where the government's communication has to go. Talk, you, you, otherwise, it's just all airy fairy scientific stuff that doesn't actually, that doesn't actually really talk to us. I mean, on the internet today, there was loads of, um, you know, the carbon tax or the carbon price, um, you know, in simple terms, because mm. that's what everyone wants, and everyone wants you to talk about it in a way that's understandable and real. Well, I'm going to keep explaining it, so, and uh, I'm happy to take any advice on the explanation, <laughs> but no, proposition number one, is our climate changing? Is our planet warming? I believe it is. I believe the science. I believe that's because of carbon pollution. So what do we need to do? We need to cut carbon pollution, and the mechanism, asking big polluters to pay, will work the same way taking rubbish to the tip has worked. It will change the way big polluters act. That's the real simple heart of this. And then everything else builds around it. You charge the polluters, then you start talking about things like how households are going to be part of the scheme, how we're going to protect jobs. But it's that simple concept at the centre that I want to keep explaining. If we get polluters to pay for something they do now for free, they'll work out ways of generating less pollution because it's costing them. OK, briefly, we've got a young man down the front who's got a comment, I believe. Can I just say your analogy to uh, running a business and comparing it to taking money to a tip is just insane. Like, people are running businesses. It's a lot different to going down to the tip and putting rubbish away. Like, this is business with people's mm. jobs, wages. You, how, how do you draw a parallel? It's a really bad analogy, in my opinion, to say that you can just <laughs> go down to the tip and you won't do it anymore. It's a lot different. It is. I mean, you can't just say that. And, and people might still, like businesses might still continue to pollute. That might not necessarily, they might not decide to reduce their emissions. So you might have no reduction then. So, well, and that I, could just get, keep getting passed on down the line because okay, the right. prices we'll, will get we'll let more the Prime Minister respond to that and we'll okay. move on to our next question. All right, well, you know, there are various ways of explaining this, but I think what that analogy is catching is that it's about the difference between paying a price or doing something for free. If you can put rubbish out for free, put pollution in the atmosphere for free, what's the incentive to change? There's no incentive to change. You can just do it endlessly for free. So the purpose of the price is to create an incentive to change. Now, smart business people who live in a competitive world, what they do all day, every day, is they look at the costs in their business and they say, how can we get these costs down? When pollution comes onto their ledger, play, paying a price for carbon pollution per tonne comes onto their ledger as a cost, they're going to look at it and they're going to say, how can I reduce that? 
It will send a price signal that if you can do your business differently, generate less carbon pollution, pay less because you're generating less pollution, that's good for your business, uh, good for your bottom line, why wouldn't you do it? That's what businesses think about every day. OK, you're watching Q&A. Thank you very much. You're watching Q&A with live applause. <laughs> uh, the program where Australians ask the questions. Tonight it's the Prime Minister who's on the spot. Our next question comes from John Whiting. Thank you, Tony. Um, I've only heard how money will flow around the economy through this new carbon tax, ultimately ending up in the hands of voters who are characterised as hard-working, struggling Australian families, and nothing about how this program will actually reduce man-made carbon emissions in any meaningful way. So, with evidence of the Greens' hands all over it, it seems to me that this tax is ultimately just another socialist policy to redistribute wealth, and in the process for the Labour Party to win back support in their heartland electorates, which Tony Abbott so nearly took away from them in the last election. Can the Prime Minister explain, using direct language and no spin, why this cynical perspective is wrong? I need to be convinced. <laughs> OK, well... <laughs> Very direct language. This will cut carbon pollution by 160 million tonnes in 2020. That's the equivalent of 45 million cars. There are 12 million cars in this country today. Imagine 45 million cars. Imagine the amount of pollution 45 million cars generate. That's the amount of pollution we will prevent going into our atmosphere in 2020 by putting a price on carbon pollution. That's what it's all about. Uh, it's all about taking pollution out of our atmosphere because that is driving global warming, dangerous global warming. Now, of course, we understand that when you put a price on big polluters, they'll innovate, they'll change, they'll generate less carbon pollution, but some costs will flow through to households. I think that was one of the points from the question here. And so it is appropriate to use some of the money raised and we'll use more than half the money raised to assist households with those costs and to direct that assistance to people who need it the most. So what I announced yesterday is that that flow-through cost to Australian families will be 0.7% of CPI. That will be the cost of living change, less than 1%. But we will want to make sure that we're looking after people in lower and middle income ranges and that's what the household assistance in the form of tax cuts and payment increases is that you've heard about. Brief, briefly now, to follow up because uh, he made the point that Tony Abbott's been making about this being a socialist policy to redistribute wealth. You've got a, uh, as you say, you've got income tax cuts at the lower end of the scale. Couldn't you have made that reform without a new tax to fund it? Well, we are providing that money because it's the right thing to do to help people with the costs that will flow through. So put a price on pollution, that will cut carbon pollution. Yes, some prices will flow through. It's the right thing to do to assist, say, for example, an older Australian who lives on the pension and that's all she's got to live on. It's the right thing to do to assist her okay. with those costs Briefly, that flow uh, through. Briefly, Tony Abbott this morning said you're being tricky about this. People will be going backwards, in fact, because you're increasing the marginal uh, tax rates for the first time in a generation. He says 15% tax rate goes up to 19%, 30% rate goes up to 33%. Well, we have chosen in providing the tax cuts to have an important tax reform, which is to increase the tax-free <coughs> threshold from $6,000 a year to $18,200 a year. Now, what does that do? It takes a million people out of the tax system. They don't have to fill in tax returns anymore. Uh, it uh, means that the value of going to work is increased for people who are, say, making a journey from welfare to work. Tony Abbott's claim is false. Not one person will pay a dollar more tax. But when you increase the tax-free threshold, of course you've got some consequential changes with rates, but no one will pay a dollar more income tax. OK, let's go to a video question. It comes from Peter Leith in West Heidelberg, Victoria. 
I'm here to say thank you. At the age of 82, I've finally survived to see a time when a group of politicians of varying political persuasions get together to agree on a program that they believe will be to the benefit of all Australians. I never thought I'd live to see the day, but I'm very glad that I have, and I would like to thank them, both personally and on behalf of my four children and eight grandchildren. Thank you. So getting a range of uh, opinions around the country. Hmm. You want to respond to it? <laughs> well, it's uh, very nice to be thanked, and of course uh, we have uh, worked to get a big reform. Uh, this is going to change the way that our economy works and it is going to change the amount of pollution that we generate. But I think the important thing that was said then is it's about his children and his grandchildren because this is about our nation's future. And I think when you take a step back from this debate, I understand it gets complicated and I understand there's been a bit of heat around it as well. But I think generally people accept that carbon pollution is causing climate change. What we're going to achieve out of this is less pollution, 160 million tonnes less in 2020, whilst our economy still grows, employment still grows and national income still grows. Well, if you can take pollution down by 160 million tonnes, whilst your economy still grows, there are more jobs around, there's more national wealth around, why wouldn't you do it? Well, there are many more tough questions in this room, but here's some supporters of the carbon tax from another age bracket, again with a video question. Hey, Julia Gillard. We're all from the Australian Youth Climate Coalition. First of all, as young people, we want to thank you for taking action on climate change by putting a price on pollution. It's a good first step towards securing the future of young Australians. But climate change is urgent and we are already seeing serious impacts. We would like to know how the government will take the next step to building an Australia powered by 100% clean and renewable energy within this decade. Thank you. <laughs> well, do you even have that ambition? Well, we've certainly got an ambition to cut the amount of carbon pollution that we generate by 80% by 2050. Uh, to do that, we'll need to change our energy sources to renewable energy, to cleaner energy. That'll be 40% of what we're powered by in 2050. Uh, so of the package announced yesterday, putting a price on carbon pollution, that'll send a signal that dirty energy is comparatively more expensive, clean energy is comparatively cheaper, so that will drive more investment in solar and wind and other sources of renewable energy. And of course, we've also said as part of this package that we'll create the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, a $10 billion fund, uh, as, which will work through commercial loans to really turbocharge national investment in clean energy sources. And when you look across this great country of ours, whether it's tidal power in Western Australia, whether it's sunshine in Queensland, whether it's wind here in New South Wales, whether it's geothermal hot rocks in South Australia, we've got abundant sources of renewable energy if we choose to use them. We can use them and putting a price on carbon is part of driving that change. 40% so in 40 years, not 100% in 10. Well, <laughs> that's, what they uh, that's right. And of course, changing your economy and changing your energy sources takes some time, but you won't get started unless you send the right price signal. And that's what putting a price on carbon pollution is all about. Okay, as I said, there's a range of views out there. Our next question comes from Richard Hughes. Prime Minister, if I could just make a comment first. I feel like I've just got a hospital pass from the 18-year-olds. Oh. Um, <laughs> the, the, the issue for them is that they're not paying for it. Um, and I think that the issue for our economy is that there's so many people in business who will be paying in some way in their business for this tax, which we don't know about yet, and which is likely to affect some businesses very negatively. That's a comment. My question is, though, this morning, the Treasurer, Wayne Swan, said on radio that the oil carbon tax would ensure that the uh, average temperature in Australia would uh, not rise by more than two degrees Celsius in the next 100 years. As a layperson, my understanding is that Australia's 
climate is affected by various global issues which affect temperatures of the oceans and wind patterns. Can you please explain to me what the Treasurer's statement meant? And how does the carbon tax in Australia affect these global issues? And if it doesn't, what's the point? Well, our, uh, our carbon pollution does affect our planet. We've got one planet, we've got one atmosphere. So if we're putting carbon pollution into our atmosphere, of course that affects us. Now, when we look around the world, other countries are acting to get a clean energy future. I mean, Europe's got an emissions trading scheme. 10 American states have got emissions trading schemes. New Zealand's got an emissions trading scheme. New Zealand's in front of us. They've acted first. Something that really should uh, make us a little, a little bit ashamed of ourselves, I think. We don't like New Zealand getting in front of us, do we? What's uh, their so, carbon price? Well, it's less, absolutely. We, less? We're making decisions for Australia, but I'm just it's making the point. less than half, isn't it? Yeah, it is. <laughs> absolutely, Tony. But, uh, you know, we're going to make decisions for our own nation. But, but the, I, I did want to make the point... Sorry, I did want to make the point, and I'm just joking about New Zealand, but um, sorry to any New Zealanders in the audience. Uh, I did want to make the point, we're living in a world where people are acting to get a clean energy future and to cut carbon pollution. So sometimes in our national debate, I think there's this sense that it's just us. It's not just us. Countries around the world are acting. Now, what that means for us is if we don't strive for a clean energy future, we're going to be the nation that's left behind. We're actually the biggest generators of carbon pollution per head of any nation in the developed world. That means to have a clean energy future, we've got a long race to run, a longer race than other people. That's why I want to start now. Now, you're obviously concerned about jobs and businesses, and rightly so. Uh, as we do this transition, of course I want to protect Australian jobs, which is why you see in the package yesterday things like uh, assistance for the steel industry, for gassy coal mines, for that part of the coal industry that raises more carbon pollution, uh, assistance as we work with businesses that are emissions intensive, generate a lot of carbon pollution, but are price takers, that is take the global price for what they sell. All in all, what does that add up to? Well, our Treasury forecasts show us that at, that adds up to 1.6 million more jobs in this country by 2020, half a million more jobs in the next two years. So, yep, I want to have strong employment and we will have strong employment, but I want to cut carbon pollution as well because our planet is risking dangerous global warming. It's driven by carbon pollution. We've got to address that by cutting carbon pollution. And uh, you talked about Australia's per head of population. We have a small population. Um, carbon emissions, of course, what people are very worried about, countries with massive populations with smaller mm. per head but vastly larger uh, amounts of emissions and what they're doing about it. I've got a question on that subject. It comes from Arthur Paris. Good evening, Prime Minister. According to Reuters, China's carbon, carbon emissions increased 10% last year to 8.3 billion tonnes. That's billion. Um, that increase alone is, is greater than our annual total emissions for the year. Isn't it dishonest to suggest that China and its people are embracing some kind of great environmental revolution to subjugate carbon emissions? Well, what we're uh, trying to get out there about China is just simply the facts. Uh, China, of course, is growing economically. It's an economic powerhouse. At the moment, uh, if you look at the carbon pollution profiles, we generate 27 tonnes of carbon pollution each, each Australian each year. Uh, each person in China generates six tonnes of carbon pollution. Now, of course, China is on an economic journey where they're still lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. Their economy is at a different stage from ours. Their nation is very different to ours. But even as they go through that journey, lifting people out of poverty, economic growth, they are taking steps to cut the amount of carbon pollution they generate. So they're doing things for, like replacing dirty coal-fired power stations with more environmentally and economically efficient power stations. Coal-fired power Just, stations? Yes, they're, but, they're, but They're closing still, down small, dirty yes. coal-fired stations and building very big 
coal-fired power stations. With, with, less, with less emissions. And that's, uh, that's part of what they're doing, Tony. Of course, what but, else but they're that's doing... That's the problem, isn't it? They're not overall... Uh, less or fewer emissions. Uh, overall, their emissions are growing rapidly, as that question just indicated. Oh, look, so, so here's a question. No, no, do you, well, do you, have, well, any, do you have any optimism that China will ever put a price on carbon, as Australia is about to do? Oh, well, if you look at uh, the, the plans in China, the next five-year plan, then they are talking about uh, trialling in some provinces, uh, in effect, pricing carbon. I use the example of what they're doing with changing from more polluting power stations to less polluting power stations. But, of course, China is the place that is uh, also generating a renewable technology, becoming the biggest manufacturer of renewable technology. So China is acting. Now, I'm not trying to put a, a rosier picture on this than reality. I just want to get across to people the facts that nations around the world that sometimes people think aren't doing anything are doing things to cut carbon pollution. India, another example, has put a tax on coal in order to deal with carbon pollution and climate change. Now, what all of this means is we've got to look at our economy, our own national circumstances, make our own decisions about what is the best way to get a clean energy future and to cut carbon pollution. And the package that I put forward yesterday, I believe is that best way to cut carbon pollution for the future. And I just think we, we do need to, to just take one little step back here and say, well, you know, we'll look and see what the rest of the world is doing and the rest of the world is doing a series of different things. Our Productivity Commission identified, identified a thousand different policies. But we've also got to look to ourselves. We know our climate is changing. We know that this is dangerous for the future. We know it will impact on the kids of today and their kids in the generation beyond. And I say again, we put forward a scheme yesterday that will cut 160 million tonnes of carbon pollution whilst our economy still grows, whilst jobs still grow, whilst, while national income still grows. Well, why wouldn't you cut the carbon pollution? Why just, not? Uh, just a quick follow-up on that, a very quick one. You can answer yes or no if you like. You met the Chinese leaders. Did you ask them uh, to join Australia to put a price on carbon? Uh, they raised with me climate change and action on climate change. It was at the forefront of their minds for discussion when leaders met between two nations. Did you ask them to put a price on carbon? Oh, we certainly talked about climate change policies and that they are doing things, including uh, looking at having provinces trial putting prices on carbon. So my point just is, the world is moving. We need to move too. We've got a journey of change here, important to our environment, as well as important to our economy. OK, we've got another question from Edmund Nichols. Prime Minister, what do you say to those people who believe your new carbon tax will result in some industries and employers simply relocating their business overseas, meaning there will be no carbon saving? Rather, the result will be a loss of business to our economy and a loss of employment opportunity for Australians. Well, employment in our economy will continue to grow. Uh, that's that figure of 1.6 million new jobs by 2020, half a million uh, in the next two years. So employment's going to grow strongly in this country. Uh, we've certainly taken a great deal of care in designing this package to look at industries that are trade exposed, world price takers, and also generate a lot of carbon pollution and to work with them to provide them with assistance, but to still leave them with some uh, incentives to change their behaviour and cut pollution where they can. I believe that we've got the package and the balance right. Particular measures in steel, particular measures in coal, particular measures for trade exposed industries that generate a lot of carbon pollution. So I believe we will continue to see these industries prosper in Australia. All right, there are very various ways to ask questions on this show. We've got a tweet just come in from PCATS. Why did Labor and the Greens go soft on 500 big polluters at the last moment? 
Well, I don't think we did. <laughs> We're asking them to put a price, uh, to pay a price on the pollution that no, they I generate. Sus I suspect they're talking about the 500 who don't, who no longer have oh, to put I a price on anything because oh. you drop them off the list of 1,000. <laughs> right. Okay, I understand. Uh, we I ma suspect. <laughs> <laughs> we, we made a decision to uh, not have household petrol uh, in the scheme. Uh, and we're talking before about making decisions for our nation. You were joking with me about New Zealand. Uh, yes, we made the decisions in the design of this scheme which were right for our country. And what do we know about Australia? Well, it's a big place. Uh, we live in a big nation. People drive. People have got very little choice to drive in many parts of our nation. So we thought our choice for our nation was that we shouldn't have in the scheme uh, household petrol, household fuel, you know, when you take your car to the petrol station and fill up. We also thought for our nation, which is a great farming nation, that it was appropriate not to have ag agriculture in the scheme. So that's the design of the scheme. We think they're the right choices. So very briefly, the 500, uh, what we were told, so uh, up until a very short time ago, uh, it was going to be 1,000 big polluters. Mm -hmm. uh, apparently now it's only 500 big polluters, but the other 500 formerly big polluters apparently don't pollute so much anymore. Uh, well, there was a consequence of deciding that the scheme would not cover petrol in terms of the number of businesses that are covered by it. Okay, it's related to that. Yes. All right, we've got another question. This one's from Daniel Costa. Thanks, Tony. Good evening, Prime Minister. Western Australia has a large and booming mining sector. Given your stated focus on taxing big polluters, can you guarantee that no jobs will be lost in WA's mining industries? I can certainly say to you that jobs in mining will continue to grow, including jobs in coal mining. They will continue to grow. So WA has got a great future in resources with growing employment in resources, including some of the uh, new energy that will come on stream. Uh, LNG projects, uh, there are many of them in the pipeline in Western Australia, they will come on stream. But we will also have jobs in the renewable energy of the future. WA is looking at tidal power. It's got some very advanced thinking and technology looking at tidal power. What a great source of renewable energy for our country. What a great source of jobs for the future. The clean energy renewable trade, when you look at the global economy, is $6 trillion. Well, I want to have a share of those jobs too, and we can get it by putting a price on carbon, driving change and turbocharging investment and growth in renewable energy. The questioner asks for a guarantee. Uh, can you give a guarantee? It's the same thing, in a sense, that your support of the union leader, Paul Howes, has demanded that not a single job will be lost in the mining sector. I can guarantee that the mining sector is going to continue to grow in the number of people who are employed in it. Our economy, I mean, let's be frank, Tony, our economy is an economy of change. And so, of course, from day to day, our economy <coughs> changes and it will continue to change. But in terms of what will be the driven and result from putting a price on carbon, we've looked at this very closely and employment in mining and resources will continue to grow, including in coal mining. So, but in some sectors, there could be job losses. Well, our economy will continue to change. You'll see more people employed in renewables, for example, all up in the economy. What will you see? 1.6 million new jobs. OK, we're, uh, we're only halfway through the incredible number of questions we have here. We've got uh, 15 minutes or so to go, so okay. we'll probably shorten our answers if we can. We've got another video question. It's from uh, Fred Geeler, the Mayor of the Torres Strait Island Regional Council, which just goes to show that people are... Get in, engage in this debate and discussion all around the country. The people of the Torres Strait could very well be the world's first climate change refugees. The Torres Strait is the eyes and ears of the North. It is a significant region of Australia in more ways than one and is in jeopardy of being destroyed. Help has been requested time and time again to assist in preventing the devastating effects of climate change but unfortunately, our own government has not come to our aid. Why have we been continually ignored? And can you see any contribution being made as a result of the carbon tax? Well, certainly, uh, we've got parts of our country that are very at risk from climate change, from rising sea levels. Uh, we've got parts of our country, uh, some of our great icons like the Barrier Reef that are really at risk from climate change. Uh, in terms of the motivation to act here, what's it all about? Well, it's about dangerous climate change and its impacts on 
our country, our way of life, our environment, and ultimately on our standard of living as a result. But what can that's you say why, to uh, that's why we're, the, um, the Mayor of Torres Strait Island that, that they are being considered specifically? Well, I'm getting on with the job of putting a price on carbon pollution so that we drive change. Uh, in terms of working with our Indigenous communities, there is part of the package which is specifically to work with Indigenous landholders. Uh, they are a great uh, store of knowledge about our beautiful landscape and how to manage it and we'll be tapping into that knowledge. Will someone be going up to see them? Uh, well I think you'll find Jenny Macklin and others are fairly frequently up having a chat and always happy to go again. Okay this is Q&A live and interactive. The next question is a web question. It comes from Suleiman Khan in New South Wales. What guarantees can the Prime Minister provide to all Australians that the carbon tax of $23 per tonne will not increase in the future? Oh, it will increase, <laughs> so absolutely none. Uh, it will increase in the future. Uh, it'll start at $23 and it will continue to rise and so will the household assistance. Uh, we uh, will continue to uh, have household assistance that will be permanent and that will match the carbon price. Uh, but the carbon price starts at $23 and then we'll move through to what we expect to be around a $29 price when the emissions trading scheme starts in full. OK, uh, we've got to follow up. We, we obviously knew that that was the answer, but I think the <laughs> interesting thing is that uh, a lot of people out there don't know uh, that the carbon price is going to continue to rise. We've got another web question on this subject from Paul Rogers in New South Wales, in Newcastle, New South Wales. If the carbon tax goes up by more than the 20% buffer, as expected, the compensation in place will be inadequate. How will citizens be compensated when this happens? Uh, well, the amount of household assistance will continue to rise. That will happen two ways. Uh, the increases in family payments and uh, in pensions are factored off the CPI. So as the carbon price rises, if the CPI increase is bigger, then it flows into th the indexation of those payments. So they keep going up. Uh, then... How will you, can I just interrupt there? How will you know um, if, the, if, it, if the price is set by the market? in advance what it's going to be so that you can actually give people compensation in advance or will they be playing catch up after uh, it, that? It will feed into the periodic indexation of pensions and family payments and then in terms of the tax cuts we have uh, uh, announced the round yesterday and there will be a second round of tax cuts as announced yesterday so the tax cuts keep pace with a rising carbon price. Okay, our next question comes from John Thornton. Uh, Prime Minister, if everyone is compensated for the carbon tax, where is the incentive to change behaviours or is this just another excuse for a tax? I feel like I'll be taxed into poverty uh, as I don't receive currently uh, family payments or pensions uh, and so on. Okay. Well, the price signal here... <laughs> The price signal that really matters the most here is the price signal to the big polluters. So we've got around 500 big polluters, as I said before, currently doing something that costs them absolutely nothing. They will pay a price. So it's that price signal that drives a change in behaviour. They're going to pass that back to me. Well, uh, they, they uh, will act to cut carbon pollution. So they will redo some of the ways that they do things now. For example, we'll generate more electricity from clean energy sources in the future. So that is a change of behaviour that will be driven by carbon pricing, catalyzed by carbon pricing. Uh, so there'll be changes in behaviour by the big polluters. That's the price signal that really matters. Yes, some costs will flow through to you, to me, to other people in the audience, to other people around the nation. How much is that? Well, it's less than 1% of your cost of living, 0.7%. And I don't want to ask you on national television what your income is, uh, but depending on what your income is, you may get a tax cut, even if you don't get family payments and obviously uh, you're not on the pension. Uh, so when we're looking across the nation, who is getting some assistance? Nine out of 10 households are getting assistance. Almost six million households are getting enough assistance. So they either come out basically square or in front. 
Why have we got people coming out in front? Well, we particularly wanted to make sure that lower income households had a 20% buffer because we understand their budgets are really tight and so we wanted to give them that 20% reassurance that they would receive 20% more assistance than the expected impact of the flow through of the carbon pricing on them. Okay, we've got a few hands up in the audience. I'll quickly get a couple of comments from the audience. The lady in black there in the middle first. Yes, you had your hand up a moment ago. Okay, the gentleman in the pink jacket. Thank you, Tony. He'll be easy to spot. <laughs> in the last couple of weeks, and particularly in the last day and a half, I've heard you repeatedly say that this is the right thing to do. I ask you, why won't you call an ele election at the first available opportunity and seek a mandate, a mandate for this proposal? <laughs> okay, I'm going to take that as a comment because, in fact, we have had that question earlier. Um, we'll go to another video question from Julian Vincent in St Kilda, Victoria. <laughs> Congratulations to you, Prime Minister, and to the Multi-Party Climate Committee for finalising the carbon price package details. But I want to remind you of a commitment you made a year ago that under your government, no more dirty coal-fired power stations would get built in Australia. Here in Victoria, there remains a proposal on the table by a company called HRL to build a new 600 megawatt brown coal power station. And we know it's dirty because its emissions intensity would be as polluting as a standard black coal power station. I'd like to know whether or not the carbon price package will, of itself, rule out the HRL power station. And if not, and given your commitment to ban dirty coal power stations, wouldn't this be hugely embarrassing, having just brought a carbon price into effect? I thank him for that question. I obviously can't comment on specific uh, commercial proposals, but what I can say to you is the advice to us from Treasury about pricing carbon uh, means that with this carbon price, there will not be, in the future of our country, uh, more dirty coal-fired power stations. People will find other ways of meeting the electricity needs that we have, including through cleaner sources of energy. Um does that mean effectively the government will be picking winners no. in terms of power generation or uh, abso absolutely will you be not. forcing, because the states are going to make these decisions, and New South Wales for example, will you be forcing or seeking it's a way to force states to move quickly? No, uh, no, my point here, Tony, is it's the price signal mm. that is uh, generating change in terms of how electricity is going to be generated. What we will do as well, and this is a complementary measure to pricing carbon, so it's the pricing of carbon that will drive the broad change in energy generation, uh, but as well as uh, complementary to pricing carbon, we will go out to market and tender to re uh, retire 2,000 megawatts of dirty, the dirtiest electricity generation. Uh, we will have companies tender to retire that amount of capacity from the system. Obviously, that will be done carefully because just, we want to make sure so the that audience those understands. Because I, I don't know the answer to this. How many uh, dirty coal-fired power stations does that include? Oh, well, it, uh, they come in various shapes and sizes, sure. so it's not a standard number of power stations, but that's the amount of capacity uh, that we're looking to retire out of the system and there'll be a tender process Do you have any that. idea how many that might include? Well, I would say more than one, I would certainly say that, but it depends on which power stations. And obviously, given there's going to be a tender process, I'll just be a little bit careful about my uh, laying out expectations as to who I think may okay. or may not tender. Well, so we have another question on this. It comes from uh, Patrice McClellan. When it comes to putting a price on pollution, it seems that the primary fear for those is for those in towns and families that would be devastated by closure. Although the Australian government is making a lot of positive move to a cleaner Australia, how is this transition made smoothly and not at the cost of towns and families whose primary source of income is fuel and energy production? Well, uh, I know that there's been a lot of fear and anxiety caused, a lot of language about places being wiped off the map and all of that kind of stuff. I mean, our lived reality here is going to be that people still have jobs, there are more jobs and many of the places that have been told they're going to be wiped off the map will still be happily in business with people living there, with people employed there. So we are going to see a transition in our economy. Yes, we are, and we want to see a transition to a cleaner energy future. But it's going to be done in a context where jobs will continue to grow, 
national income will continue to grow, our economy will continue to grow. So if I can get people to take a step back from some of the fear that's been spread, can I just give you one example of that? Uh, there'd been any number of times in the last few months that people in the steel industry have been told carbon pricing will kill the steel industry. We designed a package to work with the steel industry and the big steel producers in this country yesterday said that they recognised the government had worked with them on the package and got, basically got it right uh, to work with the steel industry. So some of the fear that's been around is really just that. It's not reflecting the reality. Just uh, very uh, specifically, uh, one case, uh, brown coal fire power generation, one of the dirtiest in the country, Latrobe Valley. Um, people there are very scared. They're all going to lose their jobs that the coal... Uh, the, the power station will be shut down, they'll lose their jobs. Is there any kind of guarantee you can give that if, let's say, gas-fired power stations are built to replace this one, that they're built there, well, uh, so where, where people can actually work on them <coughs> and help to construct them? Uh, look, I, I obviously uh, know about the Latrobe Valley, uh, being from uh, Victoria, <coughs> and I'll be uh, happy to talk to people in the Latrobe Valley about their future. Uh, as we work on tendering and taking out any capacity in the electricity system, that's going to be done in a measured way. Uh, we obviously want to make sure that, uh, you know, there's energy security and all of the lights stay on, and of course we'll be working with communities as we make any of those decisions. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the obvious question that I just asked was, uh, you're going to have to build a, a yeah, power station to replace that power station. Will you absolutely. build it there so that people know they've well, got jobs? It won't, be, it won't be a question of the government building power stations. Uh, the federal government doesn't go around building power stations, but what we will do is send the price signal, which means we move from dirtier generation to cleaner generation. Gas is cleaner generation, absolutely. Okay, we've got a, another video question. It comes from John Colley in Birchgrove, New South Wales. Hi, Julia. John Howard said that he didn't accept the more dire predictions of global warming. Just so that we know that you know how serious things have become, do you accept that we may well exceed two degrees of global warming, that this would have a serious negative effect on Australian farming and fisheries, and that we're all going to have to reduce our consumption across the board quite radically? Thank you. Well, I think that uh, is painting the picture uh, that uh, people uh, probably uh, think about a lot when they hear about global warming. Uh, I think people understand that the impacts for our country of global warming uh, can be very uh, acute. I mean, we live in a hot, dry place. And the scientists are saying to us that if world temperature just keeps increasing in the hot, dry place in which we live, we'll see more days of extreme heat, we'll see more bushfires and drought, we'll see agricultural land in the Murray-Darling Basin no longer able to be used for agriculture, we'll see icons like the Great Barrier Reef threatened and Kakadu, and what that adds up to over time is not just a big uh, problem for the environment in which we live and that we'll hand down to future generations, it adds up to a big problem for our economy and, and cost of living and standard of living as well. So we are talking about making a change today. It's not without cost. It's clearly not without cost. But we're talking about making a change today which will be better for our environment, the environment we hand down to our kids and grandkids and the generations beyond, and better ultimately for this nation's prosperity and economic well-being. And that's exactly the picture being painted by the question there. We've got time for uh, two more quick questions. Uh, the first one is from Sid Smith. Yes, Prime Minister. The question I have is, it seems as though the debate now is in the hands of the shock jocks and those who have an unscientific background to the whole debate. Could I ask you to invite Tony Abbott to a, an objective, scientific debate on the issue so that people of Australia can get a better view of what the whole debate is about? <laughs> And, uh, and can I offer this forum? Uh, <laughs> and, for and, you'll, and you'll be the scientist. For that purpose. No, I'm not a scientist, as you know. No. Uh, uh, to have a debate based on the science, people have to show respect for the scientists. And I think one of the uh, worst features of what has been a long 
divisive debate in our country is the lack of respect shown to the scientists during that debate. And frankly, I wish I could... <laughs> I wish I could sit here and say to you that's all going to change overnight, but I don't think it's going to. For me, as Prime Minister, I made a choice. CSIRO, Alan Jones. CSIRO, Alan Jones. I picked the CSIRO. I think Tony might have made the other choice. Just a, a quick, quick follow-up on that. Um, any contemplation, even, of a debate on the carbon tax? With, with Tony Abbott. I mean, this is being treated like an election campaign. Why not treat the country to a debate between the two major uh, proponents of either side of the argument? Uh, something tells me that when uh, Parliament comes back, there will be any amount of debating, Tony. Not if uh, you watch Parliament. Uh, well, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's not me that, uh, you know, doesn't use question time for proper purposes and the like, uh, but I'm sure there'll be any amount of debate in Parliament. But my essential case to the nation is, uh, of course, days of debate are good, days of action are better. We have been debating this as a planet and as a nation for years and years and years. Margaret Thatcher warned the world about global warming. Talk about a female political leader. Margaret Thatcher told the world about global warming. She was trying to close down coal mines at the uh, time. She, she, well, that, was, that was for a whole other reason. I know about that as well, coming from South Wales, mm. as I do with the Gillard family. Uh, but she warned, warned the wor world about global warming. John Howard wanted to put a price on carbon pollution. Let's be clear about this. Debating's good, action's better. We are going to get this done and it is starting on the 1st of July next year. People have got doubts, people have got anxieties. I understand that. People will wake up on the 1st of July and then the 2nd of July and then the 3rd of July and they will be able to see for themselves. Got one last question. Let's give it to Generation Next, Harry Gregg. <laughs> this is about Xbox. I'm in a lot of trouble. <laughs> As a young person, I want to grow up and raise a family in a, in a sustainable environment for the future. That's why I support pricing carbon. Since you have the support of most of the economic and scientific communities, and Tony Abbott doesn't, why is he winning the argument over pricing carbon? <laughs> well, thank you for your support. That was a tougher question you were expecting. <laughs> Uh, well, it would be good when people think about this debate later on tonight and this discussion in the audience and in the nation beyond that they remember your face because your face is what this is all about. Uh, I want to see us have a cleaner environment. Uh, I want to see us make a difference. Uh, I'm, you know, hoping, touch wood, I'll still uh, live, to tw I'll live to 2020. I'll only be, or what will I be, uh, a bit uh, under 60 then, so I reckon I'll make it uh, to see us cut the see us cut 160 million tonnes of carbon pollution out. Uh, but you're the one who's really going to see the long-term effects of pricing carbon and your children beyond you and their children beyond them. In terms of the political debate, look, political commentators will write all of that up, uphill and down dale. They've got to fill those newspaper columns. Uh, what this is about is doing what's right, doing what's right particularly for you and your generation. This is the right thing to do. I'm sorry to all those people who... Uh, thank you very much. I'm sorry to those people who still have their hands up in the audience. That is all we have time for. Please thank the Prime Minister, Julia Gillard. And in case you're wondering, we have asked the Opposition Leader, Tony Abbott, to face the Q&A audience. We hope he'll be able to do that soon. Next week, I'll be on leave. Virginia Trioli will be in this chair. Joining her on Q&A will be Oxford mathematician John Lennox. He's a Christian who travels the world debating prominent atheists such as Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens. He's coming to Australia to take on philosopher Peter Singer. On Monday night, he'll join the Q&A panel with Palestinian Australian author Arwa uh, El Nasri, documentary maker John Safran, uh, who's well known for his scepticism and fascination with religion, and atheist social commentator Eva Cox. So join Virginia, Virginia Trioli, my dear friend Virginia, I'm so sorry, next week <laughs> when uh, Q&A tackles the existence of God and the great moral challenges of our time. Good night. <laughs>